Coming up on the Potter's Touch. We all have to live between two voices. One telling you to do right and one telling you to do wrong. One taunting you saying, where is your faith? And the other one saying, hold on to God. He may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. You might be sick, but you can still call his name and he will deliver you. You might be down to your last time, but the God I serve is able to bring you out. Isn't it crazy how faith and fear can cohabitate under the same tent? This is the Potter's Touch. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm so glad to have the opportunity to be in your life. Thank you for inviting me into your home, your office, or wherever you might be watching this broadcast. The message that I have for you today, I believe is important enough to interrupt your day, your afternoon, or evening with this thought. It is more than a greeting, it's more than a card. The message is called, Get Well Soon. Some people get stuck in the moment and they can't get out. They want to get well, they just don't know how. However, they are so busy worrying about the symptoms they don't work on the root problem. Make sure you stay tuned in until the end and I will come back to you and have special prayer with you. The message is get well soon. I don't care what you're going through, you can recover. And the guy was well, he was well, he was well. He was well, he was more well than his father was. His father was an idolater. His father had corrupted all of Judea with his, with his ways and with his compromise and with his attitude. But Hezekiah came forth from a corrupted seed. He came forth a whole son. Away with the notion that if your parents weren't perfect and if your home wasn't perfect, you can't rise above your circumstances. Hezekiah is proof positive that you can bring good things out of bad places. He was the antithesis of his father, completely different in so many ways. His father had allowed idols and corruption to take over the place, but Hezekiah, from the time he was a young boy until now, was fighting to bring back true worship and, and true, true holiness. He was, he, he was fighting to tear down the idols that his father had allowed to be built in the hills and in the groves, to tear them down and to bring Judea, all of Judah, back to worshiping Jehovah again. He was, he was committed to that. And he worked hard for that. He worked relentlessly for that. He worked tirelessly for that. He tore down the idols. He resurrected a sense of worship and praise and order unto God. And he worked hard to refurbish the temple that had laid in ruins and waste. He refurbished it and renewed it and laid the gold back in place. And the cedars, people had not seen the temple like that for years because the temple had gone down because the worshipers had ceased. And the temple was an outer sign of an inner corruption because sometimes when something's not well in one place, it shows up in another. <laughs> I'm gonna let that just soak for a minute. Sometimes we're so busy worried about the symptoms that we don't get the root causes. It, it, see, you, it wasn't no need to fix the temple if you weren't going to fix the worshipers. So he began to restore the worshipers so that they would have a place to worship. Isn't it amazing how many people have the cart before the horse? How they're more worried about impressions than they are reality? They want the temple to look good, but they don't care that nobody worships it. They've got big Bibles, but they don't read them. They, oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And the guy was the real deal. He fought for the pilgrimage, the three, three annual times out of a year, they would make pilgrimages and go back to the temple to worship, and he brought that back again. According to the Torah, there were three times a year that a good and devout Jew would make a pilgrimage back to the temple, and he brought it all back, and all of the customs began to come in. And as he began to bring in the right customs, his father began to recede and die and move out of the way, and he became the king over Judea and moved into a position of power, and Hezekiah was a freedom fighter. He wasn't just a church boy. He wasn't just a spiritual guy. He wasn't just a spiritual praying priestly type of king. He was also a freedom fighter. He was fighting to alleviate the oppressors, first of the Philistines, for God had unfinished business with the Philistines. And Hezekiah made it his business to settle the score with the Philistines because you cannot sleep with the enemy and call yourself free. 
He fought long and hard to move back the Philistines and then he had to fight Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, who was a tyrant. And he fought valiantly and he fought mightily and he fought with great tenacity. Hezekiah was a warrior. He was influenced by Isaiah. Isaiah was, uh, was a bit of a mentor to him. He was a mentee up under Isaiah. He was kind of to him what Paul was to Timothy. Uh, Isaiah was the voice of reason and conscience in his ear that, that applauded him. And Hezekiah had done much to, to, to reestablish order and worship. And then, 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 then things went wrong. Have you, have you ever wondered how bad things can happen to good people. See, see, had, had his father grown sick, broke out with boils and diseases in his feet, you could kind of understand it because his father was wicked and evil and hadn't done much good. But when you've done good, when you're so good and reap bad, it's a painful experience. When, when, you, when, when you've helped and you've prayed and you've worshiped and you sang and you danced and you clapped, you came to church, you brought your tithes, you raised your kids, you paid your bills, you've been as honorable as a human being can be, and then all of a sudden trouble comes to your door. It's a shocking thing to find that none of your righteousness has exempted you from pain. You could have been a good wife and he still left. You could have been a good husband and she still cheated. You could have been a good mama and the kid still cursed you out. I know you don't know anything about what I'm talking about, but th 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 there are times that, that you are broken in ways that are confusing. To have such a good track record. Where did I go wrong? What happened? I don't know. Maybe you never prayed that prayer, but I have had to ask God, where did I go wrong? Why am I going through this after doing this and that and the other and the other? This was not supposed to end up like this. It's kind, of, it's kind of like what I was preaching last Sunday. <laughs> you remember that? When I, yeah, I've been shortchanged. I know I gave you $100 and you're only giving me back 60 I, I may have to take it, but I don't have to lock it because I know I gave you better than you gave me back. I've been, I've been shortchanged. Does anybody understand what it's like to be shortchanged? These are the things that try men's souls. These are the conditions that, that, that challenge our faith. What do you do when it seems like, it seems like, I'm not saying it is like, but it seems like faith don't work. What do you do when you've, you've prayed for other people and they got blessed and you've prayed for your situation and it, it got worse? What do you do when you can help everybody but yourself? What do you do? What do you do when you know you're a fighter but you've fallen off your horse and now you're laid on your back and there is no captivity? like the captivity you go through when you put a warrior in bed. Child was meant to fight. I was not created to sleep. Hezekiah was not made for beds. He was made for battle. He was a fighter. And there is nothing as tough as taking care of somebody who was built for battle, but they're stuck in bed. I want to 
describe beyond the physical infirmities that has brought him to the point of debasement that now he is incarcerated in an infirmity. I want to go deeper than that and to enunciate the psychological propensities of putting a warrior in the bed. So he's not just hurting in his feet. He's hurting in his sensibilities. This man has rode horses, commanded chariots, subdued armies. He has run into villages, pilgrimaged them with fire and fought his way out. And now he's laying in the bed and wondering, how did I end up like this? And what exacerbates the text is that Hezekiah was a worshiper. Can you imagine the demonic voices that were standing on the pillar saying, where your God now? Tore down all those idols, you might as well have left them up. You built back the temple, but what good did it do you now? I know y'all don't have those voices. But when I grew up, we used to have those cartoon characters and you would have an angel on one side and the devil with the pitchfork on the other. They, they both live right here. They, they live right here. The, the angel is quoting scriptures to me and the devil is saying, cuss her out. The angel is bringing back scriptures to my mind and the devil is saying, if you take this cuss word and put it with that cuss word and put it with her last name, it will rhyme. And if you rhyme, you can rap to it. And if you rap to it. We all have to live between two voices. One telling you to do right and one telling you to do wrong. One taunting you saying, where is your faith? And the other one saying, hold on to God. He may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. You might be sick, but you can still call his name and he will deliver you. You might be down to your last time, but the God I serve is able to bring you out. Isn't it crazy how faith and fear can cohabitate under the same tent? Still to come on The Potter's Touch. In some area of your life, your faith has been put on trial. I guarantee you at some point in your life, you will go through something that whether you say it or not, you will think to yourself, where is God? Job said, I looked for him on the left hand and I couldn't see him. I looked for him on the right side, I couldn't see him. I cannot see you, where are you? MegaFest 2015 is more than a festival. It's an experience. This is MegaFest. From August 19th to the 23rd, MegaFest is taking over Dallas. An extravaganza for the whole family. And 100% pure fun. There is something for everyone. Visit mega-fest.com to find event updates and to make reservations. This experience is one you don't want to miss. Look at somebody and say, get well soon. It'd be a shame to live and die and never be well. It'd be a shame to go through decades and decades and never be well. It'd be a shame to go to work and come home day after day after day and never be well. And it would be a shame to go to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and never be well. But I want to tell you something. I know a whole lot of people that go to church, but they're not well. I know a whole lot of people that dance and shout, but they're not well. In fact, you don't even know how sick they are till you marry or go home or get involved or go to work. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there, heaven. And faith has been put on trial. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, whether you're in the balcony or the back row, 
or you're sitting over here or sitting over here or in the choir or with the pastors, I guarantee you, in some area of your life, your faith has been put on trial. I guarantee you at some point in your life, you will go through something that whether you say it or not, you will think to yourself, where is God? Job said, I looked for him on the left hand and I couldn't see him. I looked for him on the right side, I couldn't see him. I cannot see you. Where are you in this marriage? Where are you in this layoff? Where are you in this crisis? Where are you in this mortgage being backed up? Where are you in my car being repossessed? Where are you in my daughter being pregnant? Where are you in my son being strung out on drugs? Where are you in my brother being HIV positive? Where are you? I was doing some research and the Ohio State University had done some research on the impact of faith on wounds. And it is a statistical fact that people who have faith recover more quickly from wounds. They heal more rapidly. They are restored more rapidly. It is also a fact, the Mayo Clinic did some research and pointed out that it is also a fact that they age more gracefully, are less prone to have strokes and stress attacks. They, they can't understand what it is. They, they, they want to point at the psychological ramifications of having faith because scientists don't always want to admit that there is a God that sits high and looks low and has all power in his hands. And what I liked about the research, it didn't say that people with faith don't get wounded. But it did say they heal faster. I cannot say that I have not been wounded, but I can tell you that I heal real fast. Look at somebody say, my faith works, my faith works. It, it, it may not stop the injury, but it hastens the recovery. I'm gonna say that again. It may not stop the injury, but it hastens the recovery. And if you don't believe it, look around you. These people you see in church today are not here without bruises. Some have been cut, some have been stabbed, some have been shot. Some have been betrayed. Some have been lied on. Some have been ostracized. Anybody else would have lost their mind, had a nervous breakdown. But every time the devil thought he... Isaiah, Isaiah's coming to visit the sick and shut in. It's maybe a Sunday afternoon, maybe in the pastor's visiting the sick. And so he comes over to visit his mentee, Hezekiah. Hezekiah, can you imagine the joy that must have filled his heart when he heard Isaiah coming through the gate? Oh, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. He's, he's coming to bring me good news. And Isaiah walked in the house and said, thus saith the Lord, set your house in order, for surely you are going to die. You will not recover. Now, you could rebuke him and say he's a false prophet, but he's your teacher. He is the embodiment of everything you understand about God has now said you will not recover from this. There's no more saying if it be the will of God because Isaiah is an eagle eye prophet. That's his nickname, is eagle eye prophet. He sees clearly and precisely like an eagle and so there's no doubt about it being the will of God. Isaiah has spoken truth. You will die. And turns around 
and walks away. And then Hezekiah begins the struggle. The struggle to recover is more intense than the struggle of affliction. It, you have to work to get well. See, this is, this is what they don't tell you. You have to work to get well. Faith without work. So, so Hezekiah turns because he, he's got some work to do. He, he, says, he says, I got a good resume. He said, look at my resume, look at my background, look at how I tried to serve you, look at how I tried to worship you, look at how I tore down the idols and look at how I restored your temple and look at how I, I, I broke yokes and look at, look at how I fought for you and look at how I stood up for you and, and the death angel is still flapping his wings and Isaiah is still headed out of the court and, and, and when you read it in Second Kings, you don't really get it till you read it in Isaiah because in Isaiah, Isaiah tells us the line that Hezekiah prayed that turned him around. Hezekiah was praying and nothing in his background was strong enough to break the hold of sickness on his life. But finally he said to God, he said, God, the grave cannot praise you. You can't get any glory out of me dying. But if you keep me alive, I promise you, every day of my life, I will give you the praise. My God, if I don't pray them, the rocks will cry out. If I don't pray them, the rocks will cry out. Do you know where I came from? Isaiah's on his way out. And he's sure he's heard from God. But just before he could get out of the outer court, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah and said, Isaiah, go back. And the Lord told me to tell you that he's about to reverse the verdict See, in, in theology, they have what they call an anthropomorphic term. It is when you use a humanistic term to explain something that defies human logical comprehension. Like, it repented the Lord that he ever made man. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth. Doesn't mean God has eyeballs going everywhere. It's just that he's using something you can relate to to explain something that you could never understand. And so, I don't know exactly what God did because Isaiah's word from God was correct. It was true. It was as true as gravity is true. Whatever goes up must come down. The only thing I can figure is that Hezekiah tied into a higher law. It's like the law of gravity against the law of aerodynamics. There is a higher law that supersedes lower laws. The lower law said, if you're this sick, you're going to die. But the higher law said, if you praise God, he will bring you out. Isaiah, go back and tell Hezekiah, if you're going to praise me, I'll add 15 years to your life. Now I know you are church folk and I don't want to bother you, but if there is a praise that'll turn things around and give you 15 years of life, wouldn't you give? What do you do when you've been a fighter and you've fallen off of your horse? Don't let the pain that you're going through deter the purpose that God has for your life. Let me pray with you that you can get back up again because I am a living witness. You can get back up again. Father, I thank you because you have the grace that is sufficient enough 
uh, to heal, to deliver, to strengthen, and to fortify. And when healing is delayed, your grace is still sufficient. Give that grace to those souls that are praying with me right now that whatever state they're in, they could look to you as the author and the finisher of their faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, let me hear from you. Let's seal the deal. I want you to just seal it right now by faith and send me a word. Let me know that you received the word and that God is strengthening you and just, just claim recovery. Uh, emotionally, spiritually, financially, whatever's under attack, uh, get well, come out of it. Don't lay in it, don't wallow in it. It's, it's, get out of it right now in Jesus' name. Thank you to all of you that support this ministry, this broadcast, and see it as a vital part of your spiritual well-being. When you support it, it really does make a difference enabling me to stay on the air to say that I care. If you are a pastor, if you are a leader, whether you are leading in a church, or leading in a department store, you need to be at the International Pastor and Leadership Conference. It's April 30th, May the 2nd. It's where great minds gather themselves together. John Maxwell, Samuel Rodriguez, Stephen Furtick, and more are coming together with Bishop T.D. Jakes to teach you leadership, leadership, and more leadership. Come and learn how at the International Pastors and Leadership Conference 2015. Register today at pastorsandleadership.org or call 1-800-BISHOP-2. Build locally. Think globally. You don't have to wish for it or sit around hoping for it. The all-encompassing freedom of Christ is yours today when you have the will to recover. I may have done what they say I did, but I am not what they say I am. Have you ever done something that didn't reflect who you are? For your gift of any size, you will receive the encouraging message from Guilt to Gratitude on CD from the Will to Recover series. Bishop Jakes will teach you how to find victory in unexpected places, how to overcome your past so that you can go to the next level, how to eliminate excuses so you can get your power back, and much more. You cannot heal it if you won't own it. And when your gift is $75 or more, you will receive the inspirational series, The Will to Recover, on DVD. However, for your gift of $160 or more, you will receive The Will to Recover series on DVD, a brand new King James Version Bible, and Great is Thy Faith Wall Art. Victory can be found in unexpected places when you have The Will to Recover. It is not your praise alone that brings about your preservation. It is also your purpose. I put something inside of you that the world is going to need and no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. And every tongue that rises against you, it shall be condemned because there's something in you this is the part